The capacity for grit is what the writers of scripture call perseverance. Perseverance rises above the hard to reach the hope. Some call that grit, some resilience. Whatever you call it, it's simply the shape of a heart that refuses to quit walking the path of God's blessings. Jesus challenges us to shine the light of his blessing. Light that won't quit in the darkest spaces and resilient blessings for broken places. Because ultimately, we've been blessed to be a blessing. Gritty light is the unwavering shine of a life that won't be extinguished by the world's gloom. It's the radiance of a soul that refuses to let darkness have the final word. It's time to shine, not despite of the darkness, but because of it. We are called to be something extraordinary. We are called to be light. We are called to bring resilient blessings to a broken world. So let's roll up our sleeves. Let's step out of our comfort zones. And let's learn what it truly means to be the gritty light our world so desperately needs. Are, Are you, you ready, ready to, to shine? shine? Hey, thanks for joining us for Calvary Online. My name is Jorn. I'm one of the gathering pastors at our Harvest Field location. If you've been following along, we're on our third message of part two of a Beatitude series entitled Gritty Light. And one of the things that Jesus is teaching us through the Beatitudes is what it means to be blessed and be a blessing to others. And as a reminder, blessing has multiple meanings and expressions. It means multiplication of life and flourishing. It means God's favor or grace. It means inner peace, happiness, and joy that's not affected by our circumstances, and the ability to partner with God. And lastly, the one we gravitate away from, the suffering and trials that are channels for God's grace. And if we're honest, much of our expectation is based on God's sovereignty to do good for us with no expectation of God requiring us to join in on the process. But as we're learning, the process of discipleship and being a Jesus apprentice is focused much more on the journey of knowing Jesus through the blessing. This is where grit comes in. Because as we look at the second set of messages from Jesus, you begin to swaddle, swallow a little hard because Christ's words begin to penetrate into those areas where we sense our own personal responsibility and accountability to face tough decisions knowing the outcome brings a greater revelation of Jesus' power to forgive and transform lives for those around us. Dan has defined grit over the last few weeks as grit is the shape of a heart that rises above the hard to reach the hope. He also says that grit is the shape of a heart that refuses to quit walking the path of God's blessing. So let me add my two cents this week. I think grit is a holy determination to go to distance no matter the cost so Jesus can be glorified. It's holy because you see it into a preferred future by faith. And though it may seem like it's too far off in the distance or you're not sure of the complete outcome, you're willing to do whatever it takes to see Jesus in a new light and a desire for the blessing of God to be a consistent part of your journey and also the journey of others. I think it's in this place where we grow and mature the most because we've let the Holy Spirit move on our hearts. See, grit is also God pushing in so you can push through. We know that grit means you have to be tough sometimes. It means you have to endure. You have to persevere. But sometimes the reason that we're not able to do that is simply because we're not letting God push in on us. And I think we have the potential of experiencing the majority of the blessing when we give in to the push. So let's look at our next set of verses, and then I'm going to pray for us. It says this in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that who is, whoever is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says you fool will be in the danger of the fire of hell. 
Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Jesus says this, Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. And I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you that um, you've given the gift of Jesus to us. He's our template and our example today of how we need to live, how to have grit, how to work through difficult and complicated circumstances with other people at times. You've given us the ability to have wisdom and guidance by the power of your Spirit. And so we ask, Lord, even as we delve into these scriptures today, that you would help us by the power of the Spirit to hear from you, that our hearts and our minds would be attuned to what you're trying to say to us for the sake of bringing glory to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of you may have uh, heard some of my story about knowing Jesus. Uh, my best friend at that time, he, he led me to the church where I would become a Jesus follower, and yet he ended up never making Jesus the Lord and Savior of his own life. And eventually this caused a schism. And one day I was with my pastor, and he knew something was wrong as we sat together in a van. He asked me, hey, what's up? And I, I, I told him that well, my best friend was being cold and distant, and he really just simply wasn't treating me very well. I said it was really weighing on me. And he said this, you need to go to him and ask him to forgive you for anything you've done to him. I'll tell you, when he said that, my head just snapped around in shock, and I said, what do you mean? I didn't do anything wrong. And he quoted the scripture I just read to you about going to your brother if he has an offense toward you. In the next moment, I exploded in anger and I punched the dashboard as hard as I could and I yelled, that's not in the Bible. My pastor sat there quietly and he didn't say another word. He was literally watching me live out this whole passage that I just read to you. He knew I wasn't going to hear anything from the Holy Spirit in that moment. But then I cooled down. And a few days later, on a Sunday morning in church, because of the conviction of his word, it led me to go to my friend during the church service and to work things out and ask him to forgive me. But I want you to know that it wasn't easy. The theme of grit, I lived it out in that moment. And it took me a while to realize what God was trying to do. When I think about all we're going to learn through this series, I believe this is what I call the grittiest of grit. It says, go first and reconcile to them. I think that this is kind of the theme of of the verses that we're reading. See, there's no way around this. If you want the blessing of God to keep flowing in your walk with Jesus, then you realize that we're called to be gritty reconcilers. See, that word reconcile, it means to mend that which is broken or to bring back together in harmony and unity that which is separated. So let me ask you, Where do you need this type of grit? How do you know this is an issue either in your life or someone you know? I mean, our world is blown apart right now. I mean, most people can't hardly stand what's happening in our nation with politics and race and sexuality. And when you think about any of these areas, does something rise up inside of you? Does something that is there that just kind of makes you want to punch a dashboard? I mean, Are you struggling with your faith in regards to things being made right? Is there moments where you just kind of feel, I don't know, a little hopeless or you don't feel like things are ever going to work out? So here's the tough part that leads us into knowing where we really stand with people. Get this. Reconciliation starts with your own revelation. So what do I mean? Well, I think the text proves out the steps of true reconciliation. The things that Jesus wants us to understand and how to come to the place where we really see the conviction of God that we need to be these gritty reconcilers. The first thing Jesus says is, 
this. And here's my point. Check out your internal temperature. Check out our internal temperature. But I tell you, it says this, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. I think it's good to remember who Jesus' audience was at that time. If Jesus was standing before us right now, there would be no difference now than back then. I believe every one of us has a boiling point. As usual, Jesus drills down into our souls with this profound truth. He doesn't address the final act of anger. He wants to root out the brokenness, hurt, and disappointment that actually leads to it. I found someone who said this about anger. He said, anger is heart murder. Anger is heart murder. (laughs) Have you been sharing Jesus with someone and you asked him if they're a good person or if they have ever sinned? What's one of the primary responses they may say? Well, I've never, what? Killed someone. We love to create extremes because we think it disqualifies us from the act. But may I suggest that when Jesus says, you'll receive the same judgment as someone who has actually murdered someone, that heart murder is against us actually. Because our hearts have become hardened and we're the ones who are dying first. Now, I know some of us run a little hotter than others, but I found out that anger isn't just someone who punches a dashboard. You could be as cool as a cucumber and use indifference as a form of anger. Not only does everyone have a boiling point, but everyone has a breaking point. Years ago, my friend Rod asked if he and his wife could come over to talk because they were having marriage problems. And and when they arrived, he told me the night before his wife exploded on him. Rod had his own dump truck business, and each day when he was done working, he'd come into the kitchen and he would wash his hands in the sink, and then he would dry them on a hand towel. He'd always done this until the night before, after he finished, the dish towel, the dish towel, it shot across the kitchen like it had come out of a bazooka and cracked him in the face. He turned to his wife and he said, what was that for? And she yelled, you don't respect me and what I do around here. He said, every day you come in here and, I, I, and you wash your hands and, and you don't get them completely clean and then you dry them on my dish towel and you get dirt on them. And Rod said, but I've been doing the same thing every day and now you say something? He said, after we talked for a while, we realized that there was something going on. And so when we sat together and we worked through this scenario, we realized this. It's never about the dish towel. There's always something deeper. And that's what Jesus is trying to address. See, because anger leads to resentment, and resentment leads to bitterness. And bitterness makes it impossible to reconcile and to forgive. See, anger is the blinding fire against reconciliation. Once we get to this point, it becomes a filter that we see everything through. We lose the ability to reason and to love and forgive. We become critical and and judgmental, vindictive, and we try in our own strengths to fix the wrongs. Because anger is rooted in injustice. It's where you say, but you don't understand what they've done to me. So here Jesus is kind of turning the tables and he's asking us, what is going on inside of you? Because there's always something there that God is trying to reconcile in you because he knows eventually it will cause problems in someone else's life. Because he knows that this is going to short circuit your relationship with Christ. And now you know. You know something is wrong, whether it's in you or someone else. So what are you going to do? Here's what Jesus says. Here's my point. Don't kick dirt on the fire. He says, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. See, reconciliation is being willing to go the distance to make things right, no matter the cost, to bring glory to Christ. It's when you realize that whatever your relationship with Jesus looks and feels like right now, it's simply not good enough. Historically, the altar has many meanings for us. It's a a place of worship and a, a place of sacrifice. It has always been a place we meet with God. And it's also the place that we make things right with Him and right with others. 
So they knew exactly what Jesus was implying. Some for sure would remember that God, what God said in 1 Samuel. He said this, to obey is better than sacrifice. So whatever you're bringing is never going to be good enough if you're out of sorts with someone. Whatever you offer to God when you know in your heart that there's a potential offense that you're keeping against your brother or sister from joining you in worship, you have to make things right. See, sometimes we need to make our altar at the feet of those who we need to reconcile with. I think sometimes we can try and reconcile with God without having to go to the person. You know, to only say to God, I forgive them or I repent is like kicking dirt on a fire, but knowing the coals underneath are still hot. It may look like the fire is out, but the coals underneath are still there. And eventually, because anger is like fire, if you don't really address it, it'll come up sometime later in your future. See, being wrong is grit. What do I mean by that? Being wrong means you admit you've done something wrong. But wronging someone who you don't think you've wronged is what we call the grittiest of grit. (laughs) Here's the thing about reconciliation. And recently someone said, but that doesn't work if the other person doesn't want to reconcile also. I said, yeah, that's why no one really wants to do it. But if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, then there are two blessings that will come your way. First, a deeper revelation of forgiveness and the love Jesus has for you and the other person. And the freedom of knowing our conscience, your conscience is clear. So joy can actually continue to flow through your life. So that those blessings that we described at the beginning of this message, the ability to serve with God, to have peace no matter what the circumstances are, the ability to see God uh, work mightily in your own heart is a part of why reconciliation is so important, at least for your own life. Now, I know that many of you have come to the place where maybe you've tried to reconcile and the other person didn't want to. But I believe that Jesus understands that there's something he's trying to do intimately and personally in us, even if the other person isn't willing. Here's my point. Be a firefighter. Jesus said, settle matters quickly. Here's what Jesus knows. The longer you wait, the less likely you will do it. I believe most of us have unresolved issues from our past. And I think sometimes the anger that we see externally on trivial things ends up being something that's much, much deeper. Some of you are deeply hurt and others are convinced that it's been too long and too late to actually go to someone and work things out. But let me ask you, are there other little fires that are consistently there? I bet there is. You can kick dirt over them and ignore them, no matter how trivial trivial it might be. But remember, sometimes reconciliation is the hope we have for someone else. You may not know this, but one of the primary names for Satan is the adversary. He's our arch enemy. And the last thing he wants is for us and the church to make things right. So let me encourage you, take care of the 1%. When when Dan and I first became friends, I was still pastoring Discovery Road Church. And one day we were having a talk about an issue I was having with someone. I said I had worked through most of the stuff and things were pretty good. He said, the devil doesn't care about what you've worked through. He only cares about what you haven't. He said, it's the 1% where he gets a foothold. I've used that saying many times with people in the last 10 years. And I can tell you that those who don't deal with it end up paying the price and living under judgment and are imprisoned by it exactly like Jesus is teaching us. Not only that, but don't let someone else live under it. When you know in your heart that all you need to do is go and speak to someone to actually set them free, be the one with the keys to unlock whatever prison they're in. Don't pay for something Jesus has already taken care of. Jesus said this, Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. (sighs) I wish I could tell you that I learned my lesson from that incident with my friend years ago. 
but I think we all are in the same boat. Forgiveness and reconciliation, it's an opportunity for us to see how much we need Jesus every day of our lives. And the hope we find in a Savior who has provided power for each of us to live in harmony with others and grow in our understanding of what it means to be a gritty people. Fighting for the salvation of others and being a living example of Jesus to the world, the world is desperate. The world needs us. And we need to be an example of what it means to be able to go the distance no matter the cost so that we can bring glory to Jesus. So let me finish with the reading of these verses and and then I'm going to pray for us. It says this in Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I think that a lot of times, if we would just understand the power of going, the power of humility, the power of saying, I have hurt you, or I need to make things right with you, creates an opportunity for these very scriptures to come alive again inside of us, inside of the people we care about, inside of our enemies, and the hope that in the days to come, we would be these gritty reconcilers, these people who don't give in to fear and the pressures of the enemy, and who realize how much the world actually needs this type of Jesus, the one that lives inside of us, so that you and I can be what the scriptures say, reconcilers for God, so that all men would be drawn to him. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity today to be reminded that you have given us everything for life and godliness. You've given us everything to do your work. You've equipped us with the power of your word and the Holy Spirit so that we can be the type of people who can bring people together. Our world is fractured, and we need to be a people who bring us together. I pray you would give us courage. I pray you'd especially give us courage for those of us who had deep hurts and wounds and unresolved things from years ago that the enemy is still holding us in tension to and telling us, don't do it, it's not worth it. I pray, God, that you would speak to all of us and remind us it is worth it. Jesus, the great reconciler, he paid an incredible price so that we could be like him. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.